Hi friends, thanks for joining us for today's service. No matter where you're watching from, we hope that something you experience today will move you a few steps closer to the heart of God. If you have any questions or prayer needs or just want to say hi, post your message in the chat window and our online campus hosts will be happy to help you. Now let's join the worship service that's just getting started. How's it going out there, Poker Hill? Let's guys get up on your feet and join us as we sing together. Swallowed by pride, but out of the darkness you brought me to your light. You showed me new mercy and opened up my eyes. From the day you saved my soul.
Heavenly Father, we just are so thankful that you invite us to come into your presence, that we are welcome and that we are loved, that you give us peace and strength. We just thank you, Father, being, for being with us today, for loving us so much. Amen. Thanks for singing with us. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And at Parker Hill Church, we've got something special planned for you this Christmas. This year, we have 14 identical services across our three locations in Clark Summit, Dixon City, and Wilkes-Barre. We begin on Saturday, December 21st at three o'clock and five in Dixon City. On Sunday, December 22nd, and Tuesday, December 24th, all Parker Hill campuses will have Christmas celebration services at two and four. There will be no Christmas celebration services on Monday, December 23rd. All of this information is available on our website. But what's most important for you to remember is that Christmas is the best time of the year to invite someone you know to join you at church. Our Christmas celebration is a perfect opportunity to introduce someone to church for the first time. So find the day and time that works best for them and join us for a Christmas celebration at Parker Hill Church. Invite cards are waiting for you at the door on your way out. Take as many as you need and watch for Christmas celebration posts on Facebook and Instagram that you can easily share with your friends and family. We'll see you there. Yeah, as you can tell, we love Christmas around here. And if you haven't figured it out yet, Christmas celebration is the most invitable service at the most invitable time of the year, which means if you have people in your life like I do in mine that could really benefit from the thrill of hope this Christmas, then you want to invite them. And chances are they'll say yes. And so use those invite cards as you head out today and bring people back with you for Christmas celebration. I'm going to be praying for you and I want to ask you to pray for me in the conversations I'm going to be having with my friends. Well, welcome to Parker Hill. I am so proud of each and every one of you for making it out of this crazy weekend. I think you're going to be glad that you came because Paul McGinnis is going to kick off our new teaching series, Christmas Carols, and you are going to be encouraged. And if you're new here today and you just braved the weather and you're just an awesome all-around individual, we're glad that you joined us and we have a gift that we'd like to give you, a free Starbucks card, and you just need to introduce yourself to us as our guest. And so you can do that by pulling out your phone and texting DC Guest to 97,000, DC Guest to 97,000. We'll text you back, but after the service, before you leave, stop by that new here area in the lobby and we'll hook you up with your free Starbucks card. As we move into our time of giving, I just want to answer a question I've heard a couple of times already. And some of you have said, hey, can I still give towards Best Foot Forward? The project where we're trying to supply uh, shoes for every kid in three schools that need them. And so if you're interested in helping us close the gap between where we are today and our goal of getting shoes for all of those kids, you can go to parkerhill.org BFF and sign up there to give. As the ushers come forward, I want to say if you're a guest today, don't feel any obligation to participate during this time. Instead, use this time to text in DC Guest to 97,000. Right now at our physical locations, our attenders are participating in our time of giving. It's the consistent generosity of God's people that allows us to make a difference in the lives of thousands of people across Northeastern Pennsylvania. If you'd like to play a part in the work that God is doing through Parker Hill Church, we invite you to click the link in the menu to give using our secure online giving platform. Our online campus hosts are available to answer any questions you have and would love to pray with you today. Click Request Prayer at any time during the broadcast to open a private chat with one of our hosts. Right now, let's rejoin the service at our Dixon City campus. Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 
All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us.
Hello and welcome, and we're nestled here between Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. So glad to be here with you as we continue into this holiday season. And in fact, today, as we kick off our Christmas series here at Parker Hill, my name is Paul McGinnis, one of the pastors here. So glad that you're here, whether you're with us here in Dixon City or watching at Clark Summit or Wilkes-Barre or part of our online audience. Glad that you're here. And it's days like today that we're especially glad we've got that online stream available. But I bet you're sad that you're not here with us because uh, if you're not in the room with us, then you're missing out on the hot coffee cocoa, on the Christmas cookies, on the stacks of money that we're giving away to those that came live today. But I'm glad that you can be home in your pajamas and on your couches. We're not jealous at all. No matter where you are, we are glad you're here as we kick off this series called Christmas Carols. And we're going to take a look at some of those songs that you hear every year in the car, at the mall, on your Spotify playlist. We're going to look a little deeper and see the stories that they tell and the true meaning that's behind them, the hope, the peace, and the joy that we can find this time of year. And I don't know about you, I love this time of year. I love the the family gatherings. I love the gift giving. I love the food. I love the Christmas movies, and I bet you do too. In fact, I bet some of you have already watched a few Christmas movies. Go ahead, be proud, raise a hand there if you've watched one or two already this season. In fact, we can do better than just raising a hand. Why don't you share with a couple of the people around you, uh, what are some of your favorite Christmas movies to watch this time of year? Share that with each other right now. My family and I just on Thanksgiving night watched White Christmas, love doing that one each year. We'll always get to, to Elf and probably Muppet Christmas Carol at some point. So let's take a poll. I'm going to give you four options, and I want you to cheer the loudest for the one that you love the most. Now, you can cheer for more than one, and those of you watching online, maybe you could, can type in a note to, uh, to your online campus pastor. But let's go through these one by one, and then you vote for your favorite. So let's start with the classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Let's hear it for It's a Wonderful Life. I don't know if you've seen this new version. This is Jimmy Stewart 2.0 here. This actually used to be Debbie Stenzi's favorite movie, but not so much anymore for obvious reasons. How about Home Alone? Let's, uh, let's give it up for Home Alone, yeah? It's like looking in a mirror there. It's like uh, Pauly McAllister, Home Alone. How about Elf? Elf, Elf is a, a, oh, a definite crowd favorite, myself included, as you can tell. You know, well, who doesn't like the stretchy yellow pants and all? And then what about, what about not just any Christmas carol, but a Muppets Christmas carol right here? Yeah, let's hear it for that. Yeah. Great times, great movies, all those, and, and plus many others. Obviously, we don't have time to go through them all. But as I was preparing this and having probably a little too much fun preparing it, I began to think that, that there really is a common theme other than Christmas, there's a common theme, a common thread that runs through all of those and so many other movies. And you might not notice it right away, but if you think about it, each one of those movies deals with loneliness. Each one of those movies has a character who at some point really wrestles with being alone. I mean, think about George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. The turning point in that movie is when he's on the bridge right? He's drunk. He's running from Potter. He's ready to end his life because he feels alone. He feels like his life hasn't amounted to anything, like it hasn't had any significant connections. And there he is alone until Clarence shows up. Think about Home Alone. Kevin McAllister wishes, like so many teenage boys, that everyone would just leave him alone and that would just make life great. And he gets his wish on Christmas morning. And after a while, it's not quite all it's cracked up to be. Being alone really isn't all that great. Think about Elf, right? Buddy the Elf, silly of a story as it is. Isn't it all about a guy who feels out of place and is on a search for his father, on a search for his home, a place where he belongs because he doesn't want to be alone. And even Ebenezer Scrooge, right? Rich, powerful, but cold and dark and empty. Every one of these movies, right? You don't notice it on the surface, but each one taps into something that we've all all felt. We can relate to. And I think maybe that's why we connect with the stories because all of us feel alone. Not all the time, but, but we often do feel alone, even in a crowd. 
especially at Christmas. And I know that for some of you this Christmas, especially this holiday season, you've lost someone over the past year. And there's gonna be an empty chair this year. And that's really tough. Others of you, maybe someone hasn't passed away, but they've moved away, right? And maybe it's because of the demands of life or, or other decisions that they've made, but you're not gonna be able to be with, with certain family members. Maybe they haven't moved away, but just drifted away. And they're not necessarily physically separated, but there's this emotional, relational distance now because of something that was said or something that went down, some disagreement or even just a misunderstanding. And now there's some relational tension and, and there's that loneliness that comes with it. Some of you I know are single. And the way you tell the story, you're still single, right? Another holiday and you're alone celebrating the holidays, ringing in the new year by yourself. And this isn't what you had in mind. This isn't what you had planned. And that's hard. Some of you don't say still single, but you're surprised to be single again, right? That relationship fell apart or, or drifted apart. And now you're separated or divorced. And, and this isn't how you had hoped it would be. And let's be honest, this isn't the case for everyone. I don't want to put a, put a big gray cloud over everybody. Some of you have great relationships right now, strong family connections at this point in your life. And yet even you at times feel that emptiness or that longing or that loneliness. And if that's the case, if you can connect with any of that or resonate with any of that feeling, then you've come to the right place. You're in good company. And today we're going to look at one word that I believe can shift that for you. One word that can give you a perspective on that loneliness and help you move out of it to some degree. It's not a word that's gonna change your situation, but it's a word that may inspire you with some hope and some peace. And it's a word that comes, as I've alluded to, from a Christmas carol that you've heard, that you know, but that you may not have paid much attention to. It's a song that we hear every year. It's a song that goes back to the 1800s. It was a song that was written originally in Latin in the 1700s and then translated into English in 1861. And it's a song that taps into the loneliness and the longing that we feel. Let me just read the first verse to you of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. What's this talking about? This is kind of heavy, kind of dark. Loneliness, ransom, captivity, mourning, exile. This is written from Israel's perspective, the nation of Israel. And I'll just give you a real quick synopsis of that history. If you go all the way back, God speaks to a man named Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a huge family, a family that will become a huge nation, a nation that will be blessed by God to be a blessing to the world. That's the history of the nation of Israel. But if you know anything about ancient or even modern history, you know that that has not always seemed the case, right? Israel doesn't always seem to be this favored by God nation, especially in ancient history. They were oppressed. They were taken captive. They were occupied and colonized. Right? There were all those years of slavery in Egypt. There was a Babylonian captivity. There was an occupation by Assyria. There was colonization by Rome where they were oppressed and taken over by the Roman Empire. And all throughout these times in history, they're saying, God, where are you? We're supposed to be a chosen people and a holy nation, and yet we're being oppressed and taken captive. And they would look ahead with hope. They would look ahead with longing because of one word, Emmanuel. Emmanuel was a word, was a name that went back to Israel's ancient prophets. And why would it show up in this song? Why are they looking forward to Emmanuel? Well, because that word comes in in our Christmas story. That word, we find that word in Matthew chapter 1. And I'll read that again. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered all this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will 
give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew, who's writing this, adds this little PS. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the word that changes our loneliness. That's the word that changes this season, that changes everything. Emmanuel, God with us. And we'll unpack that some more. But first, do you see the timeline that's happening here? I already told you that it, that it was in 1861 that a man named John Mason Neal wrote the, the English version of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Well, he was really just translating what he found way back from the 1700s, a Latin version called Vene, Vene, Emmanuel, which some people believe goes back to the 700s, this ancient Latin poem. But you go back even beyond that to the year 70, 70 AD, this guy, Matthew, we just read his story. Matthew's a tax collector. He's a Jew. He's part of this chosen nation. But it's in one of those times in history when that chosen nation of Israel is being oppressed. And they're occupied by Rome. And they're under Rome's thumb. And so instead of Matthew staying true to his people and God's promises, Matthew's a traitor. And Matthew begins to work for the Roman government and oppress his own people. And he becomes a tax collector. He extracts the tax from his people. He gets rich off that and he pays the Romans what they need. And that same guy, that same scoundrel of a guy gets to know Jesus and decides to follow Jesus. And in spite of who he is, he lives the rest of his adult life following this Jesus of Nazareth. And then near the end of his life, about 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Matthew decides, I better write this down because the rest of generations need to hear this. And so Matthew puts down his account of his eyewitness experience with Jesus of Nazareth. Now, obviously he wasn't there for all of it. So he interviews people, he gathers other documents. Maybe he even knew Mary and Joseph himself. And so Matthew writes down this account of Mary and Joseph and this surprising pregnancy and this visit by an angel. And Matthew captures this for us. And then in that story, Matthew, because he grew up as a good Jewish boy, he knew the Old Testament prophecies. He knew what was said and what was written 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah, who said all this will take place. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, I don't just share this just to give you a history lesson, but do you get what's happening here? Do you see the big picture? Here's you in 2019. Here's me feeling lonely. Not all the times, but sometimes. And especially at Christmas and even in a crowd. Wondering where is God? Wondering why things are turning out the way they are. Wondering why things are so difficult. Here's us in 2019. And 2,700 years ago, God made a promise. That whatever it is you're facing, you won't have to face it alone. Wherever it is you're going, you won't be going there alone because God himself made a promise through a prophet 700 BC that God would be with us. And so Emmanuel, it's not really a name that we call Jesus. It's just this title, this reminder that when Jesus showed up, it was a reminder of what God had promised. And God's coming through on that promise. He really is with us. And so whatever you're facing, whatever loneliness is seeping in, you're not alone. There's no need to fear because God came near. And I can think of at least three times when that's really helpful to know. At least three times when we need to be reminded that we're not alone. And the first is when our future is foggy. When our future is foggy, we need to remember that God is with us. And Joseph's a perfect example of this, isn't he? Joseph, this young man that we were just introduced to, thanks to Matthew's story. Joseph, this young carpenter who's an honorable man, who's a respectable man, who's building this carpentry business based on word of mouth and his own trustworthiness. Joseph, this guy who meets this young girl and they fall in love and they're engaged to be married. And then she's pregnant and he's not the father. And all his plans for their future are now pretty much circling the drain 
because this is not at all what he had in mind. This is not how it was supposed to go. And he looks into the future and it's fog. He sees no clear way forward. There's no easy way that this is gonna work out well. And so he's trying to devise one plan. He's trying to take care of her, but he's also trying to take care of himself. He built a business on his trustworthiness and credibility. Now his character's in question, her character's in question. What's going on here? His future is foggy. And some of you can relate. Some of you know what it's like to look into the future and have no idea what's coming next. No idea how you're gonna survive this, how you're gonna manage this. How is this gonna possibly end well? I don't know what that situation is for you. Maybe it's medical, maybe it's relational. Maybe it's having to do with your work or your income. Your future is foggy and I get that. I'm right there with you. I look into the future, I'm not sure what's up ahead. I'm not sure how this is gonna play out. As some of you may know, my eyesight isn't the greatest. I inherited a lot of great things from my grandfather, but one of the things is a genetic uh, defect with my eyes and his eyes that, that is just slowly degenerative. And so over time, the, the light kind of creeps out and the darkness creeps in. And somewhere in his 40s, he went blind. And I turned 42 this past fall. So I have no idea what the future holds. It's pretty foggy. Literally, and yet I know this, and you need to know this as well, that God is with us. There's nothing to fear because God came near. We're not walking into this fog alone. There's nothing to fear because God came near. Jesus wants us to know that, so he showed up. He came in the flesh. He put on flesh and bone. He moved into the neighborhood so that we would know that there's nothing to fear because he came near. And if God is with us, as we go into the fog, he gives wisdom, he gives direction, he gives us perspective and walks with us into that future. And so some of you like Joseph, your future looks foggy. Some of you are more like Paul. It's not your foggy future that's worrying you, it's your painful past, right? Just like Joseph and, jo and just like Matthew rather, this guy named Paul, grew up right around the same time as Jesus, the first century. This guy, Paul, was a good guy, was a religious leader, was the best of the best. But instead of following Jesus like Matthew did, Paul was far too religious for that. Paul wanted to stay true to the religious principles and stay true to the, to the Old Testament traditions. And so when he realized that this Jesus of Nazareth was disrupting that a little bit, once we were able to, to crucify and put to death Jesus, Paul then went about destroying those who were following Jesus. And Paul said, we gotta get rid of this sect, this sect called Christianity, called the way. And instead of following Jesus, he, he fought against Jesus so that he could hold to his religious traditions. Listen to what the scripture says about this guy named Paul. At the time, his name was Saul. Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. He's just picking up steam when we get to Acts chapter nine. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against Jesus' disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked them for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, and that was those who were following Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them prisoner to Jerusalem. This guy's a bad guy. He thinks what he's doing is right. He thinks he's doing it for God, but he's destroying or trying to destroy everything Jesus started to build. And it's on his way to Damascus that he meets Jesus. And he realizes that, that God is with him and that his passion and his energy, and that's good. It's just directed in 180 degrees the wrong direction. And instead of persecuting people and promoting himself, he needs to start promoting Jesus and start pursuing other people. And so Paul turns his life 180 degrees and he does not let his past disqualify him. If anyone could have, it would have been him. Here's a guy who was dead set opposed to what Jesus was doing, who was dragging them off, imprisoning them, perhaps killing them or having them killed. And yet even that past, as painful as it was, didn't disqualify him. There was nothing to fear because God had come near. And some of you, some of you have a past, a past that's embarrassing, a past that overwhelms you with regret. 
a past that, that may be stained because of what other people did to you, a past that may be stained because of some of the decisions that you continue to make yourself, a past that included an addiction that stole years of your life, or a relationship that kept you trapped and living outside of your full potential. Maybe some of you look back on a foolish choice or a series of choices or that one season or that one weekend that just changed the trajectory of your life. Or that time that you said yes when you should have said no. You decided to stay when you should have chosen to go. And because of that past, because of that guilt, you keep telling yourself this story that you're too far gone, that you're too far away, that it's too late for you. And none of that is true. Jesus came to be with us even in that. He came to be with Paul the persecutor. He came to be with the woman caught in adultery. He came to be with the alcoholic. He came to be with the addict. He came to be with you even when you keep running to porn. He came to be with you even when you keep overspending and, and underperforming. He came to be with you no matter what is in your past. No matter what regrets you bring, they don't keep you from God and he doesn't keep God, it doesn't keep God from you. There's nothing to fear because God came near. In spite of your foggy future, in spite of your painful past, he came to bring forgiveness and grace and another chance and hope. God is with us. God is with us when the future looks daunting. God is with us when our past is haunting. And it's the third time that it's helpful to remember when God is with us. Not just when, when the future is foggy, when the past is painful, but when today is tough. You see, some of you, you're not wallowing in the past. You're not worried about the future. You don't have time for either of those. You are consumed with what's current. You are hard pressed by the present. You're just trying to make it through today. And I know some of your stories and I feel some of your pain. Those of you that are single moms, those of you who are, who are separated, those of you who just can't make ends meet, those of you who are trying to find work or trying to deal with an illness or just trying to get through the dynamics of your family or work relationships, today is tough. Remember Matthew? Matthew, that tax collector who turned his painful past toward Jesus. Matthew writes this story as he's following Jesus throughout first century Jerusalem. He, he writes down that story years later and he tells us about a particularly tough day. And I think in it, it captures what so many of us feel. He writes in Matthew chapter eight, then Jesus got into a boat and his disciples followed him. They were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. They were literally following Jesus. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Are you kidding me? Isn't this how it feels sometimes? Let's just highlight some of those verses because some, some of you have lived there. Some of you are living there right now when suddenly, right out of the blue, out of nowhere, you're blindsided, you're caught off guard. A furious storm that's overwhelming and life-threatening and knee shaking and heart pounding and, and knuckle clenching, sweeping waves that bring panic and fear and uncertainty and dread. And through all that that you've faced or that you're facing right now, Jesus is sleeping? Isn't that how it feels? Sudden storms, sweeping waves and a sleeping God. And we wonder, God, where are you? Why are you so silent? Why does it seem like you're absent? Today is really tough. I'm just trying to make it through. And where are you? In those moments when we're praying for dawn, when we're hoping for a calm, when we're losing our grip, we need to remember that we are not alone. Even though God is silent, he is not absent. Jesus proved that to us. He was there in the boat. And you and I need to do exactly what Matthew and the rest of the disciples did right then. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And Jesus replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and he rebuked the waves. And it was completely calm. There was nothing to fear because God had come near. And I need you to remember that as well. When today is tough and you feel alone and it seems as if God's sleeping, he is not. He is with you. 
He is for you and he comes close and he offers strength and he offers peace and he reminds us that we are never alone. We're never alone. So what do we do with that? How does that change us? It may not necessarily change the situation, but it could change us. And so I want you to think through how you usually respond, right? How do you usually respond when the future is foggy? Well, do do you freak out? Do you get more and more concerned and worried? Do you try to take matters into your own hands or speed up God's timeline because the future is foggy and we got to figure it out now? What do you usually do when your past is painful? Do you try to keep that hidden? Forget about that, ignore that, run and hide from that. What do you do when today is tough? Do you retreat or do you power up and and try to do it yourself? Think about what you do. What's your normal go-to when you feel alone, when you've forgotten that God is with you? You see, sometimes we do crazy things. We take drastic action. When we feel alone, we do some things that, that we normally wouldn't do. It reminds me of this father who's living out in the Midwest. And on Christmas Eve, he decides to call his son living here on the East Coast. And he says, son, I hate to do this to you on Christmas Eve, but I just need to tell you that after 45 years of marriage, your mother and I are done. We're getting a divorce. We just can't stand this any longer. And honestly, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. So you're going to have to call your sister and tell her yourself. And he hangs up. And the son is taken aback. His heart's in his throat. His mouth is on, his jaw is dropped to the floor. He calls his sister. He tries to recount the conversation. Mom and dad are splitting up and the sister goes ballistic. How could this be? We can't let this happen. She hangs up on the brother. She calls the dad. Dad, no way. You can't do this. Don't do anything. Don't sign anything. Don't talk to any more lawyers. I've already talked to my brother. We're packing up. We'll be there in the morning. Don't do anything until we get there. The dad sheepishly hangs up the phone walks into the living room and says to his wife, honey, good news, the kids are coming for Christmas after all. And they're paying their own way. We do crazy things when we're alone, don't we? Sometimes that fear of being alone, especially around the holidays, drives us to take some drastic measures. But don't do that, because God already did. God took the drastic measures so that you don't have to. God himself didn't want to be alone and chose to be with you chose to be with me. And 2,700 years ago, he made a promise that he would be with us. And he is with us in our foggy future and our painful past and our tough today. And so how do we respond? Well, let's take a look at how Joseph responded. Back to this story that Matthew wrote down for us. Joseph, who I'm sure had a painful past, who now has a really foggy future and is having a really tough day trying to wrap his mind around this this, uh, miraculous pregnancy. But he's told by an angel that God is with you. And armed with that confidence, look at what Joseph did in verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do. And he took Mary home as his wife. He did what anyone would do if they were convinced that God were with them. He did what you would do if you really believed that God himself is with you. He just made the next right choice. He took the next right step. He made the wise move. He did the hard thing because he knew he was not alone. You aren't either. Whatever you're facing, however you're feeling, you're not alone. And I want to end by just giving you one glimpse at which direction God is moving. And not not just right now, but over the course of all of human history, which direction is God moving? And how, how is he in proximity to us? I can't go into a lot of detail on this, but I just want to give you a glimpse that if we go all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis 1, to before the creation, we see that God was, the Spirit of God, it says, was hovering over the waters. And we get this sense that God is above us, right? He has this power over us. He's the creator. He's the all-powerful one. And this God is above us. But then as you continue to read the Old Testament, you get this sense that not only is he all-powerful and above us, but he's also for us. He's the one that parts the Red Sea. He's the one that fights our battles. He's the one that brings victory to his people. And then in Bethlehem, he gets even closer. Not just is he above us and for us, but now Jesus, 
God himself put on flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood. He came to be with us. But when Jesus leaves this earth, it doesn't go back to how it was before. It gets even better than it was before because not only is God above us and for us and with us, but now he sends his spirit to be within us. He just keeps getting closer and closer and closer to you and to me. And he's not done. I wanna just give you a little glimpse about where God's gonna be next. I want you to see a little glimpse, a sneak peek of the next chapter. And it comes in Revelation 21. It's a vision of the future. And it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, not just temporarily, but permanently. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's what you and I have to look forward to. That's what's up ahead. And that gives us a a clue as to which direction God continues to move. He's above us. He's for us. He is with us. He's within us. And one day he will be among us, not just temporarily, but permanently. Friend, make no mistake at which direction God is moving. He keeps getting closer and closer, nearer and nearer. And so no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what's in your past or what's lying ahead in the future, no matter what you're facing today, God is never any closer than right now. And he keeps moving closer. And all you have to do is turn around and he's there. He's a prayer away. As you turn your heart toward heaven, he's there waiting for you, ready to help ready to be with you, to give you courage, to give you peace, to give you strength, to give you hope, no matter what's in your past, what you're facing today, or what you're looking at in the future. You have Emmanuel, God with us. So let me close by just reading the lyrics to that hymn that you'll hear throughout this season. And I hope now it'll bring another measure of hope O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Dispense the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. O come, desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad division cease and be thyself our king of peace. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee and has come to us, O Israel. Let me pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for the truth that's captured in that song. We thank you for the truth that's captured in that title, Emmanuel. You are God and you are with us and we can't thank you enough for that. God, it brings so much hope to know that we are not alone, but you are with us. No matter what we face in the future, no matter what pain we bring from our past, no matter what we go through today, we don't have to face any of that alone. There is nothing to fear because God has come near. And amazingly, you continue to inch nearer and nearer and nearer. God, I pray that would fill us with hope with confidence and with peace. It's in your name we pray, amen.
song together. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory. singing those songs gets me fired up inside because that's the kind of truth that we need to remember. And I'll tell you what, my dumbest mistakes have been when I forget that God is with me. I freak out about the future and I think about my past and the tough day just weighs me down. And so our hope for you is that in hearing today's message, you would carry this truth with you and not forget this Christmas that Emmanuel means God with us for all of your life. For all time, you can count on it. So glad to have you here this week. Drive safely. We love you guys. See you next time. Thanks for taking the time to join us for today's service. I hope you enjoyed your experience today because it was designed with you in mind. 
Parker Hill is one church in many places, and we'd love to see you at one of our three locations in Clark Summit, Dixon City, or Wilkesbury. All the information about our locations and times is available at parkerhill.org slash locations. And if you have a question or are ready to take a next step in your spiritual journey, be sure to talk with one of our hosts about how you can do that. We'll see you next week.